So I don't have to tell all of you that we as a you know, uh, medical system uh, in the US are, are doing kind of an abysmal job uh, at addressing the STI epidemic in this country. We have seen year over year for nearly the last decade rising rates of reportable sexually transmitted infections, um, chlamydia, gonorrhea, right? Chlamydia up 20%, gonorrhea up 56% since 2015, syphilis up 74% since 2015. And for those of you um, who are still doing prenatal care and obstetrics, um, a really alarming rise in congenital syphilis, um, which obviously has lifelong impacts on um, the health of those newborns. And while we know that anybody who has sex can get an STI, there are particular groups who are at higher risk, either because of risk factors and sexual behavior, because of lack of access to testing and treatment, or because of increased morbidity and consequences of untreated infections. So particularly young people, um, gay and bisexual men, or men who have sex with men, pregnant people, and racial and ethnic minority groups. And so while we know kind of our bread and butter reportable STIs, right, chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, HIV, we're, we're really good about testing for those. Um, mycoplasma genitalium is a relatively new STI, and there's a couple reasons why we're, we're just hearing about it now, even though it's kind of been around for decades. So it was first diagnosed in 1980s um, in men who were presenting with non-gonococcal, non-gonorrheal urethritis. It is a small gram-negative bacterium, has the smallest genome of any living organism, and we know that it can be identified in the epithelial cells of the urinary and genital tracts. What is new, or what we're finding out now, now that we have a good test for it, is that it, there is absolutely causal relationship and association for significant morbidity, both in men and women, which is why the CDC has officially classified it as an STI, which is a relatively new, um, you know, guidance, even in 2015 in the CDC treatment guidelines, it was listed as an emerging topic, but they were still a little hesitant to give the associative um, classification of an STI because we just didn't have good data on how often it was showing up with these other organisms. But as of today, as of the 2021 STD treatment guidelines, we know that this is officially an STI, it does have morbidity, and we're gonna talk a little bit about indications for testing and treatment. So as I mentioned, there is about a 35 year gap between the first time we culture mycoplasma genitalium in 1981 to the first time the CDC really mentions it in the STD treatment guidelines. And this really had to do with the fact that we did not have a good test for it. There were some lab derived tests that were DNA based in the US and research labs. Um, there was also some DNA probe tests in Europe where they were testing for it. But because we didn't have a good test to identify it, and we'll talk about some of those barriers, we couldn't establish a causal relationship with people presenting with morbid conditions like cervicitis, urethritis, PID, and things like that. So in 2015, the CDC recognized that there needed to be more data on it. We needed a good test to test for it so we can identify it when patients are presenting symptomatically and also get prevalence data in an asymptomatic population. And then in 2019, we have the first FDA-cleared nucleic acid amplification test. And then quickly thereafter, within two years, the CDC changes it from an emerging topic and formally classifies it as an STI listed in the cervicitis and urethritis um, section of the CDC STI treatment guidelines. And from there, we now have specific recommendations for testing in symptomatic populations. There's no current guidance for screening for it, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is. So as I mentioned, the big kind of hurdle to understanding the morbidity and pathogenic nature of, of mycoplasma genitalium wasn't um, how it was showing up. It was knowing that it was there when we saw people presenting. And as all of us who take care of people who present with vaginitis know, there is huge overlap in what patients report as symptoms and the possible pathogenic organisms that could be causing those symptoms. So the clinical presentation was not helpful. Microscopy, also not helpful. It doesn't have a cell wall. Can't stain it, can't easily see it on a slide. It is extremely slow to grow. It takes like six months to grow in culture. So not, I would say, clinically relevant uh, test to wait six months for the answer to your question if the patient has MGen. So we knew that we needed a molecular diagnostic test. Uh, and so we need a nucleic acid amplification test. And as I mentioned, there were some DNA-based tests. And we'll talk a little bit about why those were not super effective. 
So first, let's talk about the clinical presentation of MGen. So as I mentioned, it overlaps with all the other organisms that we commonly see patients presenting with symptoms of STI or vaginitis, right? Patients don't come in saying, I think I have chlamydia, or I think I have BV. Well, sometimes they do, because they had it before, right? They're usually wrong. Um, but they're coming in with symptoms. They're coming in with discharge, odor, irritation, itching, dyspareunia, and dysuria, right? I mean, you can see this how many times in a week, right, in regular GYN clinic patients presenting with these complaints. And we, as clinicians, are not great at being able to diagnose this empirically. Uh, if you look at the studies looking at our ability to clinically diagnose BV, yeast, uh, and trick without a positive wet mount, uh, we kind of do an abysmal job at doing it. We're often wrong. We're often treating the wrong thing if we're just basing it off of clinical presentation. And so we needed a molecular test to be able to identify each of these organisms, particularly because the sensitivity of wet preps for vaginitis symptoms is also quite insensitive, right? Only about 50% of uh, wet preps that, you know, for a patient that's tricked are positive and actually show trick on the slide. The other thing that was, is important about this organism is if it was rare, it wouldn't be as big of a deal that we have kind of been sitting on it and not doing much with it, but it's not, right? We see that the prevalence in high risk populations is higher than gonorrhea and as high as chlamydia in some populations. So it is common and it's often misdiagnosed because we didn't have a good test for it and we don't have a good clinical presentation that would say this is clearly MGen versus chlamydia gonorrhea or other organisms. So looking in at the prevalence data a little bit, just like any other STI, it's important to think about the risk factors and the population you're looking at. So these are prevalent studies, right, large population studies looking at, um, you know, testing in various settings. And so we categorize low risk and high risk based on how people were presenting. So a low risk population in this group were people who were sampled out of a randomly selected healthy population or those attending fertility clinics, whereas high risk was defined as somebody presenting for, at an STI clinic for testing, presenting at a family planning clinic for termination of pregnancy, um, presenting with symptoms of vaginitis or urogenital complaints, or people who are engaging in sex work, right? So that's where these populations were tested from, and that's how we got these numbers. So we look at a low-risk population, patients who don't have increased uh, risk factors for STI. The risk is about 1% to 3% in both men and women in terms of prevalence. Now, if you look at a high-risk population who may have multiple sex partners, not using barrier methods for uh, contraception and STI protection, rates are much higher. So in women, that rate is as high as 14%, uh, right? And so that's kind of approaching chlamydia rates. And in men, uh, that's high as 40%, particularly in men reporting uh, urethritis symptoms, right? So men tend to be more symptomatic than women with this organism presenting with urethritis. And if we look at the prevalence, this perfectly matches the same thing we see with chlamydia and gonorrhea, right? High rates in the late teens, in 20s and dropping off in the 30s and 40s when people are engaging in possibly more risky sexual behavior. And so this is just showing the correlation between chlamydia to establish some understanding about why we have been missing this because we've been so focused on chlamydia and didn't have a good test. This was probably riding alongside chlamydia uh, and gonorrhea and we just weren't testing for it. Now the health consequences for females are a little different than for males. As I mentioned, men tend to be more symptomatic present with uh, non-gonococcal urethritis symptoms. For women, we have seen high association and presence of MGen in women presenting with uh, recurrent and persistent cervicitis, pelvic inflammatory disease. And then if we look at you know, large population studies, right, we're, so we're testing large populations for the presence of this organism, and then we're looking at what is their history, what uh, other symptoms or um, diseases are they presenting with at the same time, we saw a twofold increase in an um, associated relationship with cervicitis, PID, tubal infertility, and adverse pregnancy outcomes for patients presenting with those conditions and found to have either MGen at the time that they were evaluated or having antibodies to MGen. So just so you understand where that data is coming from. Because it feels like it's a big lumped together group of, of diagnoses. And you have to remember, we only have about two years of having an FDA clear test. All of these uh, studies were being done out of research labs based on lab-derived tests previously. So I do expect that we are gonna see stronger and stronger data associating MGen with these conditions, similar to chlamydia, as we test for it more commonly with a symptomatic patient presenting. 
So to the guidelines, because I think this is really confusing for people, right? They kind of, they've heard of MGen, they know it's out there, but they don't really know who should be tested for it and how to manage patients when they test positive for it. So the CDC has a very narrow definition and guidance for who should be uh, evaluated and tested for mycoplasma genitalium. And this again is due to just lack of data to suggest that we need to screen in an asymptomatic population. So for the time being, the CDC recommends for women either presenting with recurrent cervicitis or can be considered in women presenting with PID, and then for men with recurrent non-gynecococcal urethritis. And so the one point I want to say this, you know, as a gynecologist, you know, I think we all, we all know what cervicitis is, right? We all know what it looks like. But how often are you putting cervicitis as your diagnosis code, right? How often are you putting vaginal discharge or vaginitis or something like that when you're evaluating that patient for the first time who's coming in with symptoms of odor or discharge and you're doing an STI screen uh, and doing a vaginitis panel? Does that, does that sound right? Are you using cervicitis often or are you using some of those other symptomatic diagnoses? Right, I think so. And so the reason I bring that up is, particularly you know, in, in my situation where I work in a, a community clinic, the patient may be seeing a different provider each time. But even if your colleague is seeing your provider, unless you're clearly calling it cervicitis, it may not pop in your brain that when this patient comes back four weeks later and they have persistent symptoms, that you don't just retest them for BV, right? Because they really have recurrent or persistent cervicitis that had you know, negative testing before, maybe you did treat them for Canada or BV and their symptoms didn't get better, that would be an indication to test for MGen. Um, and so it's important that we think about cervicitis a little bit more uh, in terms of our documentation or when we're seeing that patient back to make sure we're not missing the trigger for us to order it and not missing the indication for the payer to pay for the test because you have the correct diagnosis codes for recurrent or persistent cervicitis. So, um, you know, I think all of us can think back eh, probably like 10, 15 years ago where we used to test for mycoplasma and urea plasma for every patient presenting with PFROM and preterm labor, and that fell out of favor because we have um, a good amount of data showing that other mycoplasma species and urea plasmas really are not pathogenic organisms. So uh, mycoplasma hominis is associated with BV, but it's not really a, a, an STI, and it needs high bacterial loads to really present in any kind of pathogenic nature. And the urea plasmas are really considered commensal and um, not uh, pathogenic except for potentially immunocompromised people. So it's important that we don't think about mycoplasma genitalium as that mycoplasma that we used to test for 10 years ago and actually isn't something that we need to test for, right? They told me to stop testing for that. Why are they telling me to test for it again? These are different, different bugs. Um, and so the European STI uh, guideline editorial board made it very clear that there's no recommendation to be testing for other mycoplasma species or urea plasmas given that there is no strong evidence that they are pathogenic or that widespread testing either in the symptomatic or asymptomatic population really um, there's a benefit to testing in those situations because they haven't been proven to be associated with, uh, strongly with pathogenic uh, presentations. The CDC has a similar statement Right, clarifying that mycoplasma, urea plasma species, there's no recommendation for testing either in a symptomatic or asymptomatic population. And this is a nice diagram, just kind of reminding us of our mycoplasmas and our urea plasmas, and really just highlighting MGen, clearly an STI, classified as an STI, should be managed and treated as an STI, whereas mycoplasma hominis and urea plasmas really are either commensal organisms or potentially associated with BV, in which case you're gonna be screening in a different way, and those are not STIs. And then mycoplasma pneumoniae uh, is a respiratory tract pathogen. So in terms of detection, how we actually test for it, so not only is it a hard bug to test for, because we didn't have a good test, and it has all these other issues with you know, culture as a, and clinical presentation as a way to, to test for it, it also shows up in much smaller quantities on first void or dirty catch urines compared to chlamydia. So we see a low amount of the bug present in first void urines compared to chlamydia. So we don't have a lot to start with. And then it has the smallest genome that I mentioned. And so it's a hard organism to identify and amplify even with the nucleic acid test. And this, the test that was created in 2019 
was novel in the fact that it actually targeted ribosomal RNA as opposed to DNA. And that was huge because we actually saw a 40% rate of uh, infections that would have been missed with a DNA-based test, right? Because you have thousands of copies of ribosomal RNA for a specific target in the cell versus, you know, two copies of your DNA. Um, and so by using a ribosomal RNA target, we had a much more um, effective test with a higher sensitivity. The other benefit is, right, when you make a test, that target needs to stay there so that the test works. And we know that nucleic acids have a tendency to mutate, right, over time and with uh, additional replications. Ribosomal RNA is highly conserved because if there's a mutation in ribosomal RNA, the cell dies uh, as, com as compared to um, DNA mutations, which could be conserved and actually, as we'll see, has led to a high level of macrolid resistance. This is just another two studies, one comparing the Aptima uh, mycoplasma genome rRNA compared to a lab-derived DNA test showing 100% right, sensitivity for the ribosomal RNA compared to around 60% for a DNA-based test, and then two separate RNA tests um, compared to a DNA test with similar performance. So just showing that really the CDC recommends that NAT testing is the way to test for mycoplasma genitalium, and then reinforcing that ribosomal RNA is probably the most sensitive and best way to test for this organism, given it has such a small genome. So treatment, also a little confusing uh, for people, since this is new. So right now, the recommendation is to do macrolid resistance testing. I will say, as a clinician, you really can't get macrolid resistance testing in most places because there's no FDA approved test for macrolid resistance. So either the um, you know, reference lab that you're using or your hospital-based lab has to have a lab-derived test to test for macrolid resistance. But it is important because there's extremely high rates of azithromycin and macrolid resistance. Like 60 to 70% of organisms are macrolid resistant. And I think we can all assume why that is, right? It looks like chlamydia, it acts like chlamydia, and for the past decade we've been treating chlamydia with azithromycin, right? And so we weren't testing for this, it was probably riding with chlamydia, and so we have extremely high rates of chlamydia resistance, probably because we were selecting for it. There's a specific um, gene location that has a mutation that is causing this macrolid resistance that's been conserved in multiple studies. And so, um, but that being said, we're kind of losing the war a little bit on MGen, and we'll look at a few case studies about why that is, because we have high levels of macrolid resistance, and we're also developing higher rates of fluoroquinolone resistance as well. So doing the macrolid resistance testing is really indicated for a few reasons. One, antibiotic stewardship, but two, to try to preserve uh, fluoroquinolone uh, effectiveness as long as we can in patients who otherwise have a macrolid sensitive uh, organism. So, the treatment is 100 milligrams of doxy BID for seven days. That's to decrease the overall bacterial load. It still leaves about 30% of the infection present uh, in studies, and you need to come in with a second agent to basically eradicate the organism. So if they're macrolid sensitive, you do a high dose azithromycin regimen, a gram orally initially, and then 500 milligrams uh, daily for three additional days. If you don't, if they're macrolid resistant or you don't know whether they're macrolid resistance, then you use the fluoroquinolone, which is moxifloxacin, 400 milligrams daily for an additional seven days. In terms of how to operationalize this, if you have access to resistance testing, you test the patient, their MGen comes back positive, you're waiting for the resistance testing, you start them on the doxy, right? And within that week, you should get the resistance testing back, and then you can send the prescription for their second agent that's gonna complete their treatment. Um, now, I would say for probably the vast majority of you, you don't have access to resistance testing, in which case you're gonna be using doxy and moxifloxacin. Um, I will say for a lot of us, we have gotten away from using fluoroquinolones, right? Very few people are using Cipro for UTIs given high rates of E. coli resist e. coli's resistance to fluoroquinolones. And so I would recommend, depending on if you work with residents or medical students uh, or advanced practice clinicians, just refresh yourself on risk of fluoroquinolones. I have had some clinicians in my practice be really freaked out about the tendinopathy risk, and then they're worried about treating this uh, to the point that they're not actually adequately treating people. Um, so if you work with trainees or things like that, it's a good uh, teaching point to remember kind of what is the overall risk of tendinopathy with fluoroquinolones, particularly, right, really young 
or older populations. So the vast majority of the patients that we'll be dealing with, that risk is probably quite low. Uh, it just hasn't been tested. Moxifloxacin is the, huh? It's just, it's just another fluoroquinolone. So, but it, that is the one that's been tested and shown to be effective. That's, I mean, that's a generic name for it. it, and it yes, it is off patent, and you can get generic versions of it. Um, in terms of management of sex partners, since this will uh, also come up anytime we're talking about STIs, since it is sexually transmitted, um, sex partners of patients who have symptomatic MGen should be tested, just like any other STI, but it is appropriate to provide expedited partner therapy for somebody who tests positive if that partner can't get into testing. There's currently no indication that test of cure or test of reinfection like we do for chlamydia, gonorrhea, and trichomoniasis is indicated or shown to improve public health outcomes. There's just not enough data right now. I think if we get to the point of screening uh, with more prevalence data coming out, that may change. But as of right now, there's no indication to retest the way that we do for other STIs. Now, for those of you taking care of pregnant patients, it gets a little more complicated. Right? because we don't use doxy in pregnancy because of the risk of tooth discoloration, and there's not a lot of data about moxifloxacin in pregnancy. So I would say it's probably going to be a shared decision-making conversation and risk-benefit conversation with your patient. Uh, patients showing up um, you know, with recurrent cervicitis, uh, you may have to reevaluate, may work a little harder to get that macrolid resistance testing and treat them with azithromycin and do a test of cure or a test of reinfection um, but it is a little bit more complicated in a pregnant population, given that both of these medications are um, potentially problematic or we don't have enough data to say that they are safe, which is always a fun conversation with any pregnant person of, I don't have enough data to say this is safe, and they're already afraid to take Tylenol, so it um, might be a hard conversation to manage. It may also be something that you delay treatment, right? Uh, there's no indication that um, this is dangerous for um, for newborns or neonates the way that, you know, recommending treatment for chlamydia is. So if they're in the third trimester, it may be something that you wait uh, to treat depending on how bad their symptoms are or how they presented. So as I mentioned, um, MGen is on the CDC watch list for uh, antibiotic resistance because of these high, high rates of macrolid resistance. And so, and we don't have a lot of options to treat it. So outside of, you know, doxy and azithro, and moxifloxacin, there is another uh, medication that's not available in the US, which is pristacycline. Uh, it's only available basically for compassionate use in the US. So this is a case report out of Lebanon showing just kind of how this works in a patient who has highly resistant MGen. Patient has symptoms, they get tested for chlamydia gonorrhea, it's negative, they keep coming back, my discharge is not better, my pelvic pain is not better, ultimately get tested for MGen, it's positive, and it takes almost seven months for this patient to be adequately treated because they got multiple doses of doxy, multiple doses of azithro, and multiple doses of moxifloxacin and kept coming up every five weeks with persistent infection. And then ultimately got pristacycline, uh, pristinomycin, sorry, and um, at the end of that, which was available in Lebanon, and then cleared the infection within two weeks. Um, and so from an antibiotic stewardship lens, we really need to be doing a good job if we can to appropriately treat those that are macrolid sensitive and not increase the macrolid resistance in this organism, uh, given that it's getting harder and harder to treat. This is another case study um, which just highlights uh, the fact that we need to be thinking about this. So this patient uh, came in, 19-year-old female, had PID, got tested for, got treated, got tested for chlamydia gonorrhea, chlamydia gonorrhea is negative. Partners also reporting urethritis symptoms, having discharge, uh, dysuria also gets tested, negative for chlamydia gonorrhea. They keep having sex because, hey, you don't have an STI, I don't really know what's going on with you, and ultimately, finally, the patient gets tested for MGen, recognizes that's positive for MGen, both partners get tested, and the symptoms resolve. So just important, again, to be thinking about your patient who, you know, is having symptoms that sound like an STI, but their chlamydia gonorrhea is negative, making sure that we're including MGen in there at the recurrent or persistent stage as an indication for testing so that we don't allow this to keep getting passed back and forth between partners um, and obviously to alleviate the patient's symptoms. So key takeaways about MGen 
is that just remember your test indications, recurrent persistent cervicitis, or PID in women. And for those of you um, who, if you take care of men in another context, um, persistent or recurrent non-gonococcal urethritis. Um, testing is really important to target the right infection, right? We saw that long list of six different, uh, you know, BV, candida, trick, chlamydia, gonorrhea, emgen that could be causing our patient's symptoms. Really important that we're using the best test for that so that we're appropriately treating them, not adding antibiotics that are unnecessary or telling a patient that they have an infection that they don't really have, just that they have vaginal discharge. Um, that nucleic acid amplification testing, specifically with ribosomal RNA, is the most effective uh, test for detecting MGen and is the only FDA cleared test for MGen on, on uh, available. 